Well, thank you everyone for joining us to this uh, session with the Fundacion Areses and the London School of Economics. Um, we've been delighted to be partners with the Fundacion um, and its director, Raimundo Perez Hernandez, um, for well over a decade, which uh, has been a terrific mutual collaboration, both in Madrid, where we've had a series of masterclasses in social sciences, just right up to the, the beginning of the pandemic, when we switched to online sessions such as this, but we are uh, delighted and very privileged to continue the collaboration between the Fundacion Loretes and ourselves at the London School of Economics. Um, I'm delighted today to have two distinguished professors uh, with us online. Um, Professor Jeffrey Chueroth is uh, the head of department at the London School of Economics and professor of international political economy. Um, he is also part of the uh, research associate, the Systemic Risk Center at the LSE. Um, he took his PhD at the University of California at uh, Santa Barbara, I believe, and has also been a, a visiting scholar at the, the Schumann Center and at INSEAD, and indeed a visiting scholar at the IMF. Uh, Professor Michael Cox, no stranger to the, the Fundacion, both uh, online and presential in, in Madrid several times uh, when we could do that kind of thing. Um, he founded, uh, came to the LSE in 2002, founded the, the think tank, or almost the think and do tank for a university think tank in it, the LSE called LSE Ideas, which he then uh, founded and directed until 2019. LSE Ideas was uh, always in the top three uh, university affiliated think tanks in the world, which is no mean feat for creating something brand new uh, in London, which competed and, and had a great impact worldwide on foreign policy. He's also been the chair of the Chatham House uh, Group on United States Foreign Policy, um, and is a welcome to the to, to the debate today on inflation, the cost of living, and geopolitical aspects of uh, the current crisis, as we're calling it in many parts of the world. So, thank you very much indeed, uh, gentlemen, for for joining us today, and thank you again to the foundation for its continuous support from many parts of the world. But our, our two bases um, in London and Madrid have served us very well over this period of time. So, so I want to come to our our, our topic of discussion uh, today. We are going to be looking at uh, inflation, but we're going to be looking at the cost of living crisis, but we're going to, as we do at the London School of Economics, try and understand the causes of things, which is the motto of the school, and try and understand perhaps what are the wider uh, impacts and what are the wider root causes of where the economy seems to be going, given we have a lot of different um, variables, let's call them, a lot of different storms in different parts of the world that are impacting on the way in which our daily lives are impacted. So this is not the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. This is not a pandemic situation, but we are in a very new, unusual uh, situation where a number of uh, geopolitical and, and economic factors are impacting the way in which uh, the economy is is growing or, or has been uh, impacted for uh, in, in inflationary ways that we are struggling to contain. So I would, would like to start with, with Jeffrey, if I may. Um, perhaps Jeffrey could tell us some of your points of view on how the uh, current economic situation, what, what you see as the root causes of the current economic situation, and perhaps we can take that into the wider discussion with Professor Cox as well. Jeffrey, over to you, and thank you. Yeah, sure, thanks, Adam. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I guess the first thing I would start with is to make the point that when we talk about inflation, inflationary crises, what we're really talking about here is what's going on in advanced countries in the northern part of uh, the global economy. So when we talk about inflation, it's really something that's affecting these countries more significantly than those in the emerging world, which are particularly those in Asia where we don't see this problem as, as, as prevalent. So I put that out there first. The second thing I would elaborate is sort of the root causes are, are, are variable, right? So when we talk about inflation in the United States or inflation in Europe or inflation in the UK, uh, these things have different different root causes. So I'll try to make that point as well. The first thing, the most obvious point, of course, is to start, start by talking about the lingering effects of supply chain problems associated with COVID-19, right? So uh, even though we've, we've come away from the pandemic, knock on wood, and we're out of that particular uh, part of, of history, we still see problems associated with that that are causing uh, supply chain issues. All these have obviously improved uh, significantly over the past year or so. Related to that, of course, is what's going, what continues to go on inside China, right? So 
uh, rightly or wrongly, maybe we can discuss this uh, more fully as we go through today, the government continues to insist upon a zero COVID strategy or what they're calling dynamic zero COVID strategy, which means periodic lockdowns in parts of China, including those that are uh, centers of manufacturing and global production, right? So, so long as the government in China continues to persist with this dynamic zero COVID policy, this, this creates problems in terms of bottlenecks, supply chain problems, and so on associated with uh, um, um, uh, that particular strategy. Um, the third thing I would come from, and obviously this is, or, or point to rather, and this is obviously associated with uh, with many people's fo focus today, and we'll certainly come back to this, is the results of the war in the Ukraine, right? So when we think about the impact that the war in the Ukraine has had on inflation, there's multiple mechanisms that we can tease out from this, right? So the most obvious one, of course, is that these two countries, Russia and, and the Ukraine, um, are important centers of, of commodity exports, right? And not just oil and gas, but foodstuffs, corn, wheat, and so on. And when the, the war hit and created sort of bottlenecks and production issues, uh, export blockades and these sorts of things, uh, it created problems in terms of pressure on, on with the, the price that we pay at uh, petrol stations, the prices that we pay in grocery stores, restaurants, and so on. So, so part of that's coming through, uh, you know, sort of commodity price problems or, or commodity price um, increases. But it goes much further than that, right? So, when we think about the position of the Ukraine and 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 Russia in the global political economy, both of these, if you look at the data, uh, stand out much more prominently in terms of their forward and backward linkages. Uh, inside supply chains or even for global value chains, right? So both of these economies, when you compare them either to, to typical fuel exporting economy or the even typical non-fuel exporting economy, you would see that they that, that they are significantly involved in, in 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 these types of things. Just to give you an example, right? So you know Ukraine is obviously an important part of the breadbasket of the world, providing us with corn and wheat and whatnot. But Ukraine also supplies uh, half of the world's semiconductor grade neon. It's critical for making uh, lasers that we use to make uh, computer chips and whatnot, right? And Russia, even though it's obviously important in terms of, of providing us uh, with fossil fuels and, and, and fuel, provides a significant exporter of nickel, of palladium. These are critical for things like catalytic converters and batteries, right? So it's not just commodities. It's that these things are these countries are linked into the global value chains, and we're seeing this choked off. Also related to the war is this issue of financial sanctions and, and technology sanctions and trade sanctions against Russia, uh, which is obviously having an impact uh, as well in terms of uh, uh, the, the prices uh, that we pay. In terms of Europe, one of the big things that Europe is hitting hit with, of course, is, is the use of, uh, of energy as a weapon, right? So Mr. Putin has drawn upon um, the, the centrality of, of Russian gas exports uh, to Europe and weaponize this in the same way that the West chose to weaponize uh, various linkages it had with Russia. And it's the shutting off of this gas or the, the slowly cutting off of this gas that's gonna increasingly affect the European uh, economy. And the last point that I'll make, um, the last two points I'll make rather is, you know, we in, in, in response to uh, this COVID-19 shock, Right, uh, governments around the world, particularly in the advanced world, but uh, in terms of the magnitude, in terms of the duration of the policy response, put a lot of money into the economy. Right, there was a tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus put into the economy in the United States, in in the UK, and elsewhere. And, and you know, this was important in terms of dealing with this hopefully one-off or once in a generation exogenous shock that we felt. But then when you put all this um, fiscal stimulus into the economy, when you reached for tools of monetary policy, like interest rate cuts, you know, using the central bank's balance sheet for quantitative easing or large scale asset purchases, this is gonna have a long-term effect in terms of, 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 of prices. And this feeds into my last point that I'll make, which is on top of all these different things, people like you and me and market actors more broadly, now expect more inflation, higher levels of inflation, right? And so as a result, our expectations have become somewhat unhinged from the previous target that we used to have, 2%, right? Where if you ask the public now, what do you expect inflation to be? It's no longer 2% or anywhere near the targets our central banks have set. It's much higher. And once you start to expect higher levels of inflation, you demand higher amounts of higher levels of wages. And this feeds back into uh, inflation and you get these wage price 
spirals. So one of the issues you have is even if we resolve all these other things that I've talked about, you know, COVID-19 supply chain, zero COVID in China, uh, the war somehow gets resolved in a way uh, where supp you know, supply issues associated with that are resolved, you still have to deal with public's expectations in terms of higher inflation and bringing those down are a huge challenge for for governments and, and central banks. And, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah, that's a fantastic overview, I think, of, of the, all of these different variables of a global perspective, as well as the ones that we face, you know, when we go to the, to the, to the uh, in, our, in our daily lives as well, that we expect and we read about and, and, and uh, trying to, to understand. Mick, if I, can, if I can come to you, I mean, we, it, as Jeff was saying, it looks like just as we are coming out of the COVID pandemic, truly a global um, impact and shock to the economy, uh, the, the, the war and the invasion of Ukraine started, or there are thereabout. So um, just at the point where, as, as also Jeff was saying, quantitative easing was something that was going to be tapered off and, and planned to be um, changed over the period of time, even going back to the financial crisis throughout this, the last 10, 12 years. Um, we have a, this enormous global shock localized to an area, but nonetheless with global implications. What, what's your, your take on that in terms of the, its effect in the geopolitical um, environment? Well, just briefly, I mean, firstly, if a war is going on effectively in Europe, then that undermines confidence. I mean, it's a huge, huge shock to stability. And as businessmen repeat and constantly tell me, business likes stability, it likes order, it likes, and that is not what they've got at the moment. So there's a kind of broader question of destabilization of expectations. Where's the world actually going? You know, and secondly, I mean, just to add further points to this, Putin very shrewdly and very ruthlessly is weaponizing this. I mean, clearly one of his own calculations, uh, and we can only speculate because I don't have direct access to Vlad, but basically we know that he weaponizes this and he, he knows he's not going to win the whole of Ukraine. He's facing a series of military setbacks on the battlefields in eastern Ukraine, northeast and in the south now. So he has options. I think he will both try and bolster the military lines of defense, successfully or otherwise, I don't know. But his other weapon is really to put the pressure on the Europeans uh, through energy. And you can see this happening all the time now. You saw that with the OPEC decision yesterday with the Russians and the Saudis. You know, uh, that's going to push up prices of energy. Uh, they know that a number of European countries are de highly dependent still. Uh, on, on, Russian, on Russian energy. And they're hoping, in a sense, that the problems caused by this energy inflation, the, the huge rise in energy prices, although it's went down a bit, it's going to go up again now, will bring political pressure to bear upon governments in the EU, Europe, Germany, maybe Italy as well, and others, to put pressure on their own governments, in a sense, to start putting pressure on the Ukrainians to try and come to some negotiated settlement. I mean, that's what I think is happening, viz particularly the Ukrainian and Russian uh, situation, apart from all the other things that Jeff pointed to in terms of food prices and all sorts of other things uh, like that. I can just add too on the inflation and the wage issue. I remember in the old days, Jeff, when, when I was around in the 70s, when people were talking about trade unions being far too strong, and Mrs. Thatcher, we were told, had got rid of all this trade union power. We were always told that what really caused inflation was wages. Mm. You know, too, too much high wage demands caused inflation. Therefore, to, to kind of follow the free market logic, you had therefore to reduce the power of the, of the, of the workers, trade unions, organised labour, and that would bring wages down. We're actually in the reverse situation now, it seems to me. Um, we're not in the situation where high wages are causing inflation, seems to me, Jeff. It right. seems to me if you look across the EU, and, and you know more about this than I do, or the United States, and certainly in the UK, wages have been either stable, stagnant, or in real terms, going down mm. for a very long time. And then suddenly you've got a triple whammy of food prices going up, inflation, housing prices going up, mm. And energy bills going up. I know energy bills are going up, so I just got my first bill this morning on the new tariff. So if you're in that situation and you've been wage stagnated for a number of years or period of time, then what you're going to see, and I think this is the political outcome of this as well, uh, Adam, and this will be my last point, I think we're going to see increasing labour militancy. We're already seeing it in the UK. 
And I think we're going to see actually more political instability more generally. I'm not advocating it, but if you're, you're actually in a perfect storm. You know, inflation is going up on three levels, housing, energy, and food. That's pretty important stuff for most ordinary people in the world. Your wages have been pretty stagnant for a fairly long time. You know, work it out yourself. There's going to be a lot of pushback to get wages up. And that, I think, is going to lead to either more labor militancy. And we're already seeing this in the UK. I don't know what's happening in the US, Jeff. Uh, and we're going to see, I think, a result. Of, it also makes Europe more unstable politically. We've just seen this in Italy. And I'm not saying it's all down to inflation. That would be absurd. But clearly, the background for many people today is a worsening economic situation, which I think will have political knock-on effects, certainly in Europe, and I think almost and certainly in the United States, as we'll see in the midterm elections. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mick and, and Jeff as well. Jeff, perhaps we can come back to you on this on the energy question, I think, that, that uh, you both highlighted, really, because it seems to me one of the, obviously, the commodities and the, the sector in which crosses over right through supply and chain issues, right through geopolitical and into institutional OPEC and other decision making where the geopolitics play a massive role. Jeff, do, do you see um, what, what's your sort of analysis of, of, the, of the energy sector as a whole or any global impact that we are seeing now from energy supply and demand, uh, both from, from the, the, the European basis, but also from the Middle East and elsewhere, and the impact that will have also on, on uh, prices, which will impact in a much higher way the, the countries that are much more dependent on energy imports, such as China and Japan and, and elsewhere. Yeah, thanks. I mean, the, the headlines in the UK this morning, I don't know if you've seen them, are quite depressing on that, right? They're warning of the possibility of rolling blackouts during the winter, um, uh, which is just you know, extraordinary uh, when you think about um, the context in which we're, we're living today. And um, I don't think that gets easier in the next in the next year or two, right? And you see, you have governments like the UK reaching for policy toolkits. The other day, Germany introduced in a, in a, a roughly equivalent type of government intervention in terms of protecting households from these types of things. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how do you fund these types of initiatives, right? So, uh, without betraying my own uh, political affiliations, you know, there's 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 a rather disappointing um, strategy in this country of, of, of failing to, to use the bumper profits uh, that many of these energy firms have accumulated as a result of these price shocks that you're referring to, and to utilize the proceeds from the windfall tax to fund these types of things, instead uh, utilizing the general taxation uh, as a way of, of paying for this, which would be a rather exceptionally expensive uh, type of intervention. This is in contrast to what the Europeans have tried to do, which is to not only uh, force some of the energy firms to accept the burden of the of the of the cost, but also uh, to avoid using uh, general taxation, right? So that the, the way that they've used the price caps in places in Europe, for instance, have been different than the way they've used it in the UK, um, and that creates all sorts of issues. That you know, I mean, just to come back to mixed concerns about political instability or uh, labor militancy, or just. In, you, know, you have this sort of intergenerational issue at stake, or, right? Which is that, you know, if you're going to use general taxation as a way to fund these massive interventions and put aside, at least in this country, you know, recent changes in terms of fiscal policy, then that means essentially that you're asking, you know, younger or young people to fund these types of interventions um, uh, to protect the the uh, essentially. Uh, older generations from from the cost. Now, I'm not saying that the old generation should be responsible for their energy bills, and I'm not being that cruel hearted. But you know, there are alternative ways of dealing with this. I mean, the you know, Mick is perhaps better placed to to uh, to talk about this than I am. But you know, you, all this is occurring. You know, the Americans signaled quite clearly the other day they were less than happy uh, with the OPEC decision uh, that the Saudis and others were not playing a ball in the way that the Americans uh, would have otherwise liked, and um, the, the trick for the Americans, however, is you know, it's not quite clear they have the tools or the leverage that they used to in order to get these types of these countries to play ball in terms of American uh, and European policy objectives. And so that creates huge tensions. But that being said, you know, if I was Saudi Arabia or, or, or these large oil exporting countries, I, you know, I, I can the, the logic behind making these types of cuts that they did the other day is quite clear. Right. They. They, they realize that in the long run, uh, 
they have to diversify away from this. And so there's an incentive, a very strong incentive to take to, to engage in more short term like behavior where you take advantage of this and try uh, to, to pull to pull yourself w w with the Russians. Um, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sid. Mick, would you like to pick up on that? Yeah, I was just uh, going to jump uh, in on that. I, I mean, I haven't studied the OPEC decision in great detail, and I, I'm not an oil economist, so I don't want to pretend that I am. But from the geopolitical point of view, it looked to me that it was Russia more than anybody else that was pressing very hard for this, uh, for this lowering of production in order to get the prices up. And the Saudis went along with them. Now, the Saudis, as, as they often say, they're not always... The, the closest allies with the United States. There are problems in that relationship. We know that. But it's nonetheless a very critical relationship for the United States, as it is, Adam, as you know, a very critical relationship for Saudi Arabia as well on geopolitical reasons, for economic reasons, the euro dollars, you know, the massive amounts of money that comes out of sovereign wealth funds out of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and oil. So this is all crucial to the stability of the world economy. So I did think, uh, without treading on any toes, it did strike me that Saudi Arabia gave in, but that, that then right to Russia, basically, is a Russian pressure. And that tells us, again, what I'm talking about is, is, is Putin is clearly playing very hard ball on this particular question. He wants to squeeze the West. He wants to squeeze the European Union. And this is one way of doing it, get those prices back up again, and increasing the pressure on European governments then to get back to the, to the war, Adam, to put pressure on the Ukrainians to come to some negotiated peace, which would favor Russia rather than Ukraine. And the Ukrainians won't go with that, by the way. That's another question, but that's a large, larger issue. So, I, But it also raises the point that Jeff also hinted at there, and I, I'll add to that. What leverage does the United States still have with some allies who would 20 years ago said, yes, <laughs> you know, it would have saluted. And not always. I'm, I'm not overdoing it, but you know, don't want to overdo how much power the United States has. It has an enormous amount still, clearly, it's still by far and away the most significant economic and military actor in the world today. But it does tell us something really about how much leverage the United States now has, not just on Saudi Arabia, but you know, in, in other parts of the world. I'm not I'm not saying you know it's in decline, it's imperial, you know, pulling back, you know, it's overstretched. I think that's overdone. But nonetheless, I do think it, 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 is, it must be worrying. And as Jeff hinted, I think the Biden administration was mightily fed up, mightily fed up, because it contradicts the policy that they've been mm. doing is get production up and keep prices stable or get those oil and gas prices down. I mean, just on the on the leverage of the tools that Mick was talking about, I mean, there there is I mean, I, I would be shocked if this happened, but you have. Um, Democrats in the in the House threatening to introduce legislation that would um, essentially withdraw the U.S. troops and missile defense systems from the Gulf, from Saudi, from the UAE, uh, if they don't um, change tack. That the, you know, they would pull out American contractors, American, essentially using the American security guarantee as the as leverage. And the other thing that they're essentially going to, to have to do, as other countries are, is they're going to have to crank up supply on their own. Um, and I guess what What's worrisome is, you know, the 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 shocks from the Ukraine war and the particular energy pressures is going to create difficulties in terms of government's commitments to to other goals like climate change and net zero, right? So yeah. on the one hand, you're saying we have to increase supply because we have no choice in the short run uh, to turn to these to these mechanisms but in doing so you're you're rubbing mm -hmm. against these other goals that you're trying to uh, to achieve and and so the you know western governments are caught in this you know qu quite difficult bind uh mm -hmm. at, at the moment and um uh, that that's going to be a regrettable consequence of this i believe is that you're going to see difficulties in terms of governments can being able to to continue to hit those types of targets yeah if i could just jump in there just uh yeah. just on just point to Today or yesterday, was it, Jeff, the British government announced it's going to start further exploration of oil, presumably some gas, but oil mainly in the North Sea. Yes. Um, you know, so and energy security has now become the buzzword. Energy security means don't be don't be too dependent on overseas supplies, particularly if those supplies are coming from, quote unquote, hostile states. We want friendly states to be our economic suppliers of key strategic commodities like oil and gas. 
or you become energy independent as much as you can. In that regard, of course, the United States has huge advantages over anybody else, because if they choose to be so, and they already are in to some degree, mm. they can be energy independent. But for a country like Britain or Germany or Germany. any of the European countries, they can't be. But it's very, very interesting to see what, what the British government announced yesterday. And uh, it's also going to be very interesting to see what happens in Germany too, by the way, Adam, on this. Because as you know, there's a very powerful anti-nuclear lobby uh, which has been very politically significant in German politics through the Grüne and, and others. And, um, you know, so there's a very ideological pro, uh, opposition, unlike in France, to, uh, to nuclear power. Now, uh, is there also going to be a, a beginning of a turnaround in Germany on nuclear power? And that takes a long, long time to get a nuclear power station up and running, 10 years. Mm. Nonetheless, and I think Jeff is right. Two years ago, or even last year, at COP26 in Glasgow, you know, the world was watching and everybody was talking COP26, you know, getting it down, 230, zero, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, all the, all, the, all the things that went with it, that, that dynamic, that pressure, the wind in that particular sail, it strikes me, Jeff, and I'd be interested to hear your point of view, seems to me the wind in that particular sail has gone to, or not to zero, mm. but it's certainly much weaker now. And it mm. throws off, therefore, what has been a key strategic yeah. policy objective of most Western governments, which has been articulated time and again over the last 10, 15 years on climate change. Yeah, it's difficult to put climate change in the in the front of your mind when you know you have yeah. a lot of vulnerable people that are going to suffer if we don't do something about energy, about fuel. I mean, the other thing I would just add to this is what's regrettable is that you know we saw the writing on the wall about 10 years ago when Putin went into, into Crimea, right? So the West had its opportunity to begin to put in place, and I would point the finger particularly at, at the continental Europeans, Germany in particular, to begin to diversify or minimize their vulnerability to these types of, of pressures. And, you know, I'm, 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 my research is focused much more heavily on the finance side in my career. And you can see that the, you look at the data on Western banks, you look at the data on Western um, uh, non-bank financial intermediaries, you know, pension funds, investment funds, these types of entities began to cut their exposure to Russia greatly after the 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 intervention, the annexation of, of the Crimea, right? It's such that when this this shock happened and the war occurred, and you saw all these sanctions and so on, most Western banks and investment funds were largely immune from uh, this because they had minimized their exposure greatly over time. The same cannot be said uh, for for energy, for gas. Um, and 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 that that may be perhaps one of the 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 most significant negative legacies of of Mrs. Merkel's time in, in Germany was her failure to 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 adequately do something about Germany and and Europe more broadly's vulnerability to this type of pressure because it was clear this was going to happen almost ten years ago and um, and that's part of the reason why we're in this these circumstances today. I, I'll just jump in quickly and then you can come back in with one because I want to add to that because I've been looking at this too, Jeff. It's quite remarkable about Mrs. Merkel's reputation. I mean, until about two years ago, I mean, you know, she was number one. She was the only stable person in Europe with a stable government. Uh, Muti, you know, enormous international prestige, you know, a, a, a simple lifestyle, no corruption, all that kind of thing, and very stable policies. Now, as Jeff has pointed out, I mean, basically, I, I'd say his, her historical reputation has really gone to not from 100 not to a zero but certainly gone down considerably and as jeff pointed out because germany and under merkel after 214 instead of kind of seeing seeing the writing on the wall which a lot of corporates did i know that from talking to people a lot of banks did they started to limit their exposure mm -hmm. for obvious clear reasons governments didn't to anything like the same and why didn't they very simple because they wanted they wanted cheap energy cheap gas yeah i mean keep keep the electorate happy which democratic government doesn't want cheap energy but keeps the electorate happy. So in a way, we can blame Merkel, and I think it's easy to do so, though I'd still say she was a democratically elected politician. And she did what most democratically elected politicians usually do, which is listen to the electorate and want to get elected again. And cheap energy was one way of doing that. Now, of course, we're in a situation quite the opposite of that, and we're in a much more critical situation, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I mean, it's, uh, it's, as we've been discussing today, these the geopolitical both the causes and the consequences sometimes have longer roots, and some of them, in, certainly in the Russian situation, have very long 
roots and causes mm. for where we are now today, as we as mm. we know well. Um, Jeff, I wanted to come come back to you in, in terms of a sort of international response. You know, during the financial crisis, we saw incredible coordination between international financial institutions um, and and other actors within the global domain to try and address the the the, uh, the, the cliff edge that the world found itself on in financial terms. And then during the pandemic as well, a lot of more, slightly different kind of coordination, but certainly a sort of global impact, a global uh, shock that meant um, the international response, international community, let's call it certainly for financial institutions, had to act in a, in a certain way. So, so what, where, where are we now? What, what kind of policies or is there coordination within, within these international institutions and domestic actors that, that is is uh, seeking to address some of these issues? Can they address them? Is there some more kind of collaboration that we saw in previous uh, crisis situations? Sure. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll put aside for now, because we can come, maybe come back to later what central banks have been doing. Uh, there's some coordination there, but it, it, it much more driven by domestic circumstances. And then I'll, so we can come back to that. But at the international level, and you can start at the level of the, of the sanctions, right? So in terms of, Sanctions, what you have is essentially, you know, even though I hate this dichotomy and we, we tell students at the LSE not necessarily to use this for a variety of reasons, but you do have this sort of West versus the rest, right? You have incredible uniformity amongst the West in terms of uh, taking a position against Russia with respect to these sanctions and, you know, financial technology and trade. Uh, this is something that Putin obviously greatly underestimated when when uh, when he launched this attack, and I think there's been a strong signal sent uh, to China on this regard. So on that part, you see great coordination. One of the reasons, unfortunately, why the war has been able to carry on as long as it has is because the rest, and I don't just mean China, we can talk about China mm. separately if you'd like, is that there's a whole group of countries out there, you know, India, a number of emerging market countries, Brazil, and so on that are just not interested in playing by the West's rules, right? And, and so they're, they're willing to not necessarily flout the sanctions, that's too, hard of a, of a, too harsh of a term, but to, to find ways to work around them, right? So uh, using alternative currencies, alternative payment systems, these types of things. Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's regrettable for, for a number of reasons, understandable from these countries' perspectives, but, but deeply re, uh, regrettable in terms of, you know, the types of the, the cost that the, uh, people in Ukraine have had to endure as a result of this. And I think the West probably, to some extent, underestimated the extent to which others would not be willing to to come on board. Mm -hmm. Separately, I would point to at the international level, you know, one of the big fallouts from all of these things is we're seeing this wave of of debt distress in the emerging countries, in the low income countries, at levels that we've not observed previously. Right. So if you look at Things like borrowing costs for emerging countries and low-income countries, they are at levels that we've not previously observed in, in, since the global financial crisis. They're certainly exceeding those we saw prior to the pandemic. You see a record number of countries in what we call d distressed debt or, or mm -hmm. a, a risk of, of default, if you prefer. Uh, we've seen uh, countries turning to the IMF at record levels. So if you look at the amount of money the IMF has dispersed in the last year, this is at a level that we've never observed previously. So it's more than what we saw when we when the Europeans uh, were encouraging the fund to, to bail out uh, Greece. Bigger than the loan that they recently gave to Argentina. Bigger than loans they gave to emerging markets in the 90s during Asian financial crisis and the early noughties and so on. So we're seeing record levels of of, uh, of disbursement by the international community. That's a collective response. That's a, I would take that as a, as a positive thing, right? Because this is, these are global institutions, even if they are Western backed or if you prefer more critically Western dominated, that all the countries are sort of playing ball in terms of agreeing to do this. What's, what's where well, we're seeing some difficulty on, uh, and there's, there's a lot, a lot coming out on this mm -hmm. in terms of the better data on this is that China has, has not, always seen eye to eye with the Western countries on how to deal with distressed debt or, or, or debtors that are in distress, right? So the West has a set of institutions that they've set up historically called the Paris Club. And this is the group of the largest official creditors out there that come together and work uh, on a plan to deal with countries that are in distress, either for rescheduling or debt reduction in some particular way, trying to deal with this in a collective way, you know, finding a solution that works both for the debtors, but often the even, evenly or equitably distributes the, the burden across the creditors. And China is not willing to take part in that historically. 
Sometimes they have in the recent past during COVID, other times they have not. And this creates problems, right? Because for many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but also elsewhere in South Asia, their largest debtor is not the West, it's not the International Monetary Fund, it's China, right? And so China plays a huge role to play in all of this. And it hasn't always been willing to, to step up in the same way uh, as Western countries in providing for debt relief as opposed to debt restructuring, or sorry, debt rescheduling. That is, China continues to want to have itself uh, be repaid. And, and you know, the most spectacular example that I would give before uh, my, my last comment is why this matters is look at a country like Sri Lanka, right, where you saw high levels of debt distress lead to incredible levels of social unrest, partly usually due to the inflation things that you guys were, we were talking about earlier, uh, government's inability to, to cushion uh, 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 people's uh, ability to, to afford food. Um, and you saw the government collapse in a spectacular fashion, right? They stormed the presidential palace. You saw these pictures of people swimming in the president's swimming pool and eating his dining rooms and these sorts of things. Um, and this is this is down to, to financial distress, right? Or the inability to somehow deal with this in a, in a collaborative way. And so um, that's deeply problematic because we don't have a solution yet for that. It's only going to get worse in 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 the in the in the in the coming coming months, particularly as countries. So, excuse me, as central banks in the West move towards greater amounts of monetary tightening, you're going to see interest rates rise. You're going to see greater amounts of debt distress. And so the international community has to come together in some way to deal with this. And, uh, you know, I would I would also, you know, again, to highlight China, it needs to come on board and 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 to become a more, you know, to use this language, responsible share, shareholder, responsible stakeholder in this process mm -hmm. to, to deal with with these types of distress, because it's 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 going to get quite worse in the in the coming months. Yeah, I, I I'll follow Thank on you. from Jeff then, yes. because I think the chances of China becoming uh, what's called a responsible shareholder or stakeholder, as it was the term originally used by Robert Zelik uh, many many years ago, two thousand and five, I think it was. I think the chances of that now are fairly slim and getting. <laughs> um, it's not because China doesn't have an, a stake in the world market; it clearly does. Uh, in, in ways that are still significant. And that may well be in the long term, you know, the, the, the way in which China comes back in from the, from where it is at the moment. But where it is at the moment is in a very different place to where Bob Zelik would hope it would have been back in 2005. Now, why has it evolved and moved in a certain direction, uh, which is away from that integration, you know, agreeing with the West on most of the key issues and on many of the key issues it still doesn't disagree with the West actually on some issues you know. but nonetheless to, to come back to your question and to, to Jeff's point it, it, China didn't turn up for COP26 it has closely aligned its position on Ukraine with Russia in spite of claiming all the time that it's defending the sovereignty and integrity I, I, I'm writing a book on this at the moment so I can't tell you how many Chinese handouts and, and, you know, spokespersons, press conferences I've had to go through and kind of want to sometimes hit, hit the computer because it just drives me mad. Now, clearly they are backing Russia, even though they don't want the war, they're backing Russia. But that's for long, that's for geopolitical reasons. And that brings you to the point. Why is it backing Russia in a war it didn't really want, I think? Mm. Ukraine, with which it actually had very good economic relations, trade with Ukraine went up four times in the, in the five years before, before it's collapsed now, of course, by definition. And the reason for that really has to do with Ch China's geopolitics. And it has to do, let's be honest, individuals make a difference. Xi Jinping's view of the world is a very different one to that which was originally held by Deng Xiaoping and his predecessors, who said, keep your head down, keep your head low. Xi Jinping takes a very different view. He says, look, China doesn't have to keep adapting to the international order. The international order now has to start adapting to us. And we will start setting some rules of the game. And our long-term competitor, and China views this quite openly, they're not, they don't hide the fact, is the long-term competitor of the United States, even in the Ukraine. China doesn't think it's really about Ukraine at all. It thinks it's about the United States and NATO. You know, so that's, that's its perspective. And if you can't get the two big economies of the world agreeing on the fundamentals about what is the nature of this war, you've got a real problem. Just to add to Jeff's point on the on what, what's gone on, I mean, everybody in the West, well, we're all going to back, 
behind the brave Ukrainians, and they are brave, don't get me wrong. Zeleny, you know, has demonstrated extraordinary leadership abilities. I mean, rather remarkable leadership abilities, maybe one of the very few leaders in the world today, if one's honest about it. Yet, nonetheless, you look at the various votes in the UN over since the beginning of the war in Feb 24, how many abstentions came from what we used to call third world countries, emerging economies, in Africa, South America, India, obviously, is a very important player in all this, Jeff. And again, that brings you back. Not everybody's backing Ukraine or not everybody's against Russia. And even if they're a bit embarrassed about the war, they're sitting on the fence. They're not taking a clear line, as many in the West and Washington. And that, again, gets us back to the point we mentioned earlier on, Adam. U.S. leverage is less. I mean, time and again, what's been interesting you know, if you listen to countries, even if you don't agree with what they're saying, this is what they're saying. The U.S. has been running the world for too long. Uh, didn't it intervene in Iraq? It pursues double standards. It constantly imposes conditions on any economic. Aid. China's come in with the money. You know, I think, you know, in a way, we said Mrs. Merkel would maybe was blind, but maybe the West more generally in the U.S. more generally slightly un underestimated the degree to which it slipped in terms of what you might call global opinion, particularly in, you know, in, in the global south, and, and, that, and a price is now being paid for that. Yeah, I mean, I just, can I just, if you don't mind, Adam, I, 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 the last point, yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that the, the corollary or the, to that is that at the same time, the position of the U.S. within the West is, is, is strengthened significantly as a result definitely, of this, definitely. right? That, I agree. Uh, whereas, I mean, for a variety of reasons, the past four years, prior to Mr. Biden, there were reasons why many in the West would be less than happy with U.S. leadership. Now we're seeing the reverse. Mm -hmm. I mean, can I ask, I want to make about, about China. And so, you know, we talked about Xi and, you know, his decisions. I mean, it, it, it's been a really difficult uh, couple of years for Xi, or at least this particular year, right? So you have the fallout from zero COVID. You have uh, the problems in the property sector, which are just uh, sure. increasingly stretched. You see mortgage buy boycotts. Uh, you're going to see some types of slow-moving financial crisis there. You see this, I would say, a misjudgment in, by the Chinese in terms of Russia's ability to actually achieve its objectives in the in the Ukraine. You see growth that is now below levels of its Asian peers, mm -hmm. right? So China's going to get, if it's lucky, it'll get 3% this year. It probably mm -hmm. won't. Mm -hmm. So lowest level of growth since the 1990s, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, he's trying, he's, he's probably going to secure an unprecedented third term in office, right? In, in, a, in a week or so when, they, when the Chinese uh, uh, meet for their, for their party Congress. Um, and so, you know, What's 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 difficult here is what is what can we expect from him? You know, given that he's in this, you know, he's got this strong political base. I guess he's going to get he's going to get this third term in office, oh. but now he's got all these other constraints he faces, plus you know the the issue of Taiwan, um, mm -hmm. which um, you know that's not yeah. going to go away. And I, the I, West I... has signaled that it's you know if Ukraine is anything to go by, that they you know that you're going to see some type of Western response in terms of Taiwan. And Mr. Mm. Mr. Biden, you know, he's not the best with words, but, you know, <laughs> he signaled that America's probably willing to go there and, 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 yeah. and back yeah. Taiwan. No disagreement at all, Jeff. I, I, I mean, all my friends who are what I call Sinologists, these are the guys who know Mandarin, go there, well, don't go there, but, you know, study the thing, I've been studying it for years, come up with all the same issues, the, all the problems that she is, she is facing and many more besides and uh he's he, he at one level he's very strong and very powerful because he he seems to have about 20 jobs <laughs> running everything and he's purged a lot of people under the anti-corruption campaign and many and many other Bauchi Lai and many others on the other hand the problems he's facing are just huge and that's what my my my, my expert friends on China tell me the, the point I would still make however Jeff going back to the war in Russia I've seen no evidence at all, even in the crisis that Russia's in at the moment, uh, for, for Xi to actually change change tack on Russia. It's been really quite remarkable. He, he stood by his man. Uh, and I've been following this very, very carefully through August and September. No indication whatsoever. If anything, I think that relationship in some weird way has got stronger because Russia has become weaker mm. and therefore more dependent on China. And China, I think, fits into, you know, a kind of Chinese geopolitical strategy 
uh, without going over the top and kind of getting back to the Cold War. I don't think it's that. And I think, therefore, I've seen no evidence at all of, of Xi pulling back. Now, I imagine in Zhonglan High, you know, in the, in the leadership, there's a lot of debate going on about wh where we're going to go with this. And there would be two issues, one issue in particular, where China might pull back from Russia, though we've seen no indication of that yet. And this has been going on, by the way, since that first Ukraine crisis of 2014, when that relationship started to really ratchet up to the serious level it achieved by February of this year and now throughout the war. The one thing I think which would really worry China more than anything else is the whole question of nuclear weapons. That's it, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, look, let's be honest. China's very tough at home on lots of issues. But, you know, human rights is not exactly top of their particular agenda. Events in Xinjiang, even if some of it's been exaggerated, are pretty, pretty tough-minded. They've been very tough over... Hong Kong. So I don't think they care about that, but they would worry if, if Russia really was serious about this, and that would lead to a uh, to, to real crisis in the relationship. One final point, Adam, and, and on, I'm glad you mentioned Taiwan, because one of the things I've been following again very closely is how Russia has fallen in, pushed in behind China very, very hard on Taiwan. It started back with the 216 election, when the KMT lost and uh, the new president came in, uh, the, the lady who, bailed, by the way, by the, studied and worked at the LSE for, for a period of time her, herself, they've, they've come in really on the, behind China on Taiwan very, very strongly indeed. Very strongly indeed. Now, and we saw what happened after the visit of Nancy Pelosi and the China's response there. But again, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister in a speech at the UN on September, I think, 24, not very long ago, put, made a very tough speech on China. We will stand behind China on one China policy. We will not support any move towards independence. And the final point to make it, the Chinese also think America is shifting its position on Taiwan, which is a bit worrying. Because the one China policy is embedded in the original agreement with Nixon back in 72, the Shanghai Declaration. Now they think America will keep formally to that, but will shift within that from what it called, what America used to call strategic ambiguity to strategic non-ambiguity or strategic certainty. And, and I think they've been told very in very clear terms that the United States is now back in Taiwan. It's never gone away from Taiwan. It gives it six billion a year in military aid. And that, that I think, is going to become a very big area of conflict. And uh, I, I don't know quite what will happen because we'll China see. is... A lot of people in the West say territory doesn't matter, but it matters to the Chinese. Absolutely. You know, identity matters to the Chinese. Territorial integrity includes Taiwan within that. What lessons they've drawn from Ukraine, Jeff, I, I, I'm not too sure about, but uh, they may have drawn the lesson, don't go invading countries because it's a very dangerous thing to do. On the other hand, they may have concluded, well, you've got, to, you've got to take it, do it differently to the way that Putin did it, maybe do it more subtly and more intelligently. I think that, that, uh, that is subtly and more intelligently. We, we'll see how, uh, from a geopolitical front, how important these issues are, I think, in, in affecting all of the as I say, at the, at the front end, from the consumer point of view, what we see in the shops compared to mm. what is going on in the rest of the world. So it's been terrific to link some of those together. Jeff, I wanted to come back to the point you made earlier as well about Chinese growth at 3%. I mean, this is something, as you say, we haven't seen for uh, 20, 20 years or so. And we get used to, of course, everyone in Europe would bite your hand off for 3% for a long time. But but certainly in, in, in China, 6, 7, 8, even, you know, potential overheating issues like that are the ones we're used to facing. 3% is is almost, you know, uh, is, is, is a very different number, let's say, in terms of the way in which the Chinese economy is developing. So, so I wondered what, what, what impact that would have as you, we talked about global supply chains post-COVID, mm. China's role in, in, in the world economy, it's particularly in supply chain issues for, for consumer goods and, and other, other goods um, uh, from, from, from export-led uh, growth that they have. Um, that's, that's one area I thought was, was, was something we should, we should just touch on briefly as we're we're, quick, we're running out of time soon, but also to get your or both of your opinions on uh, some of the fundamentals, the indicators that we've been discussing, you know, inflation, interest rates and so on. You, you mentioned, Jeff, that we're probably in for a, a rough ride in coming months, possibly years. Is, mm. is that probably the situation we find ourselves in, in, in the West, as, as, you, uh, as you clarified earlier? On? So two things, Chinese, Chinese growth and impact and also the, the, the medium long term outlook that we're now facing, given the situation we're in. Yeah, sure. Just thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, quick question on the implications of the Chinese sl slowdown. Um, 
Yeah, so and as Mick pointed out, it's multifaceted, right? It's not just property and 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 debt. It's the Chinese economy is getting older, and you know um, the sort of the the, the worry has has always been, and, it, and this is still present, is that China will get old before it gets rich, and and if that happens, then it'll be stuck in this so-called middle income trap, and I think that's that's one of the the great fears. I mean, you know, the the, the knock-on implications of slowing Chinese growth are, are clear for the global economy, right? So. The world economy has benefited greatly over the past two decades or so from from Chinese growth, right? So it's been the major engine of growth, accounting for you know anywhere between a quarter and thirty percent of global GDP growth, right? So it's been this major driver of growth, not just the workshop of the world, but just pumping out um, economic growth more broadly as other countries enjoyed greater riches as China got richer as well. And we're likely seeing the end of that period. In fact, I think we have seen the end of that period, right? So that that miracle of sorts has 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 disappeared. And you know, just in thinking about that as well, Adam, related to your to your other question about interest rates, you know, one of the one of the things that the global economy benefited from, in particular the West, and why we saw this period that we referred to prior to the financial crisis of 2008 is the great moderation. Of, of, of asset prices and and, and and just consumer prices more broadly is that China's integration into the global political economy, right? So that was a key driver as to why we were able to enjoy, you know, moderate weight, sorry, moderate price increases over that extended period. And if these in more supply side elements were critical, these, these, these elements that were exogenous to what our central banks are doing are separate from, if that's no longer available to us, and, and it certainly won't be in the way that, um, we experience there won't be another China type integration to the global political economy in 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 our lifetimes, the three of us around this room, um, if ever again. And what does that mean in terms of of things like inflation? And so to turn to that, you know, as you said, you know, there, there's going to be, you know, to put it bluntly, a lot of economic pain going around uh, in the Western world. Um, central banks, you talked about coordination earlier, are moving towards. Not necessarily coordinated hikes in the sense that they're meeting and deciding how to how to react in the same way they did in 2008, but you see this this general movement towards monetary tightening. You're seeing this in the U.S., the ECB. You're seeing this in in, in the U.K. You're seeing this in Switzerland. You're seeing this even in Australia. The other day they didn't tighten as much as as we we had thought they would. So it's it's a it's a general Western phenomenon. Um, and you know in this country, in the U.K. in particular, they're talking about as a result of the fiscal event as they you know we experienced the other day uh we see even higher interest rates expected and and that's going to create an enormous amount of pain particularly for those on 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 short-term uh mortgages as we typically have in this country the other thing that's feeding into this if i could add to this is not just interest rates is that we're seeing this process of what we refer to as quantitative tightening right so i talked earlier about quantitative easing you know most of the our audience will be familiar with this over the past 15 years or so, where central banks in response to the global financial crisis and 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 the decade and a half of sluggish growth or so that it followed that is that they turned to their balance sheet to purchase large amounts of, of assets, government debt, various types of asset-backed securities. In some cases, like Japan, they purchased equities and so on. So all this ended up on our central bank's balance sheets, such that by the time of COVID, so even just before COVID, right, we saw our central banks with the largest balance sheets uh, in peacetime, right? So there's enormous amounts of assets on their balance sheet. And then COVID just took it to a whole nother level, right? So if it was at my shoulders here, it's above my bookcase and behind me now. That's how much intervention we saw as a result of central banks um, intervention into the economy. And now they're getting rid of this stuff. Now they're allowing this stuff, uh, these assets to mature on their balance sheet. And rather than reinvesting the proceeds um, of these assets, they're allowing these 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 balance sheets uh, to retire, and that quantitative tightening will have a significant effect on on interest rates as well uh, as a result of that. And you're seeing these somewhat serious disruptions in in certain parts of the economy. Um, two caveats to that, if I could, before I'll I'll, I'll, I'll stop. One. In this economy, in the UK, uh, the government's, um, I'm going to be honest here, poorly implemented uh, announcement of uh, its fiscal plans led to a significant jump in interest rates and in, in British treasuries, which could have brought down, potentially brought down 
uh, a set of pension funds as a result of the types of investments to leveraged pet pen, sorry leveraged investment strategies they had pursued to insulate themselves against adverse inflation movements. As a result of that, the Bank of England, which had been trying to go towards tightening, had actually to intervene uh, to 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 ensure that pension funds um, uh, didn't 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 go insolvent. So that's one caveat. The other caveat. Um, is in Europe, what you what you what you've observed is, even though the ECB has signaled it's also moving in that direction, it's implemented a anti fragmentation instrument uh, of sorts that seeks to mitigate the pressures that countries like Italy and and Spain and others on the periphery, if I can use that language, of the eurozone uh, that experience higher levels of borrowing higher borrowing costs, excuse me, during the Eurozone crisis. So one of the worries in Europe, for instance, is you would saw as the central bank, as the ECB began to turn off the taps, as it begins to decelerate its asset purchases, as it moved towards quantitative tightening, you saw borrowing costs begin to rise in places like Italy, for instance. And so the worries we were seeing what they call fragmentation in the Eurozone. You saw German levels a bar of German borrowing costs diverge increasingly from Italian borrowing costs, for instance. And so this worries the ECB for the same reasons that it worried it 10 years ago, that you see this potential divergence, if you will. In the language of, of um, you know, central bankers, it, it disrupts the monetary p transmission mechanism because it's the interest rate cuts or interest rate hikes don't get passed on the same way in, say, Italy versus Germany. So they introduced this new instrument which essentially would allow the ECB under certain conditions to intervene in, in government debt markets, right? And this was to, to deal with the potential adverse effects it would have on market confidence if the ECB just said, look, we're not gonna buy any more government debt. And then Italy spirals out of control in the way that it did before. So even though we're seeing this general trend towards monetary tightening, it's important to highlight these two recent developments, one in the ECB in terms of this, anti this anti-fragmentation instrument that they've introduced, and two, the uh, Bank of England's um, uh, recent interventions. And, uh, and just, just to point this out, you know, I, I give much credit to the Bank of England for doing this. And in fact, it was very transparent the other day in, in being forthright and calling the government out directly and saying, we did this because of you. And they were very direct in sort of mm -hmm. speaking truth to power and saying, the only reason why we had to do this is because of this uh, poorly implemented, poorly announced, and poorly conceived, if I can put it that way as well, uh, uh, fiscal uh, event. Um, Absolutely. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just, Jeff. can I just jump in, Barry, with maybe making make over to you. broad uh, uh, Jeff's points absolutely great there. And I'm, I'm, don't get me talking about the current British government. That, that <laughs> Final few not. points, if you would. No, 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 no. Yeah, far yeah, far yeah. too parochial, far too parochial. Um, if, if I'm honest about it, I think it all goes back to Brexit. I mean, the, fundam the fundamental rupture in Britain is actually about Brexit. And I think this is all the working way through of, of that particular vote in June of 2016. But let's not get into that far too parochial for your audience to hear about. And maybe we are going to see improved relations between the UK and Europe, as we've seen over the last couple of days. Who knows? We shall wait and see. However, I wanted to make three more general big points, if you like, to build on uh, Jeff's terrific observations on the markets and the finance side. After 2008, I think we had a, a good run in spite of 2008. And why did we have a pretty good run? We had cheap money. We had a, a booming China economy, a, one of the new engines, massive engines of growth. And also we had great power cooperation, as you pointed out in your comments earlier on, Adam. We are now moving into an era of expensive money. <laughs> That's another word for inflation. Uh, we are certainly not seeing China going to act as the engine of growth for all the reasons that Jeff gave and no doubt many more beside. And also there is a debate going on in China today of, about decoupling from, from a Western economy overly dominated by the dollar and by the US, which is also another worrying aspect of the future as well. And the, the third thing is we, we no longer have great power cooperation. I mean, you know, there may be obviously movements at certain levels and certainly the West has come together. And Jeff, I absolutely totally agree with you. You know, if you had asked me after Afghanistan, I'm like, oh, goodness sake. I mean, we're in real trouble here. Mm -hmm. Biden has just made a decision, which frankly implemented it was one of the worst he's ever made. Um, but nonetheless, where we are now year on is, is very, very different place. So the West has come together. 
But in an era of expensive money, in an era where China is no longer playing the role it played before, and in an era where the great powers are more in conflict than in cooperation, I think these are the three great worries moving forward, Adam, building on many of the more specific points that uh, Jeff made. And therefore, I do end up, like most academics at the moment, not just at the LSE, where we do study the causes of things, but we also need to study the consequences of things as well. <laughs> Equally important. And I think, yeah, I'm in, I'm in a pretty, pretty miserable place at the moment about the future. I, I'm not a naturally miserable or pessimistic person, but I think with Jeff, I don't know, Jeff may disagree, but we've got to be a bit worried at the moment where, where, where for long-term trends we've identified. I'm afraid so. I, yeah, it's difficult ahead, to be optimistic. Yeah, final, final few words, Jeff, please, yeah. No, I would say the one the one cause of optimism is, um, you know, Mick did point to it, I mean, a few times saying just recently is, you know, after Afghanistan, we had hit a point where yeah, I think most of us, you know, whether you supported, you know, Biden or not, uh, were deeply pessimistic about the West's prospects and competing yeah. uh, uh, with with its rivals and, and even about democracy more broadly. Right. I mean, we were in a, a deep funk. Um, and, you know, if anything, the the war in Ukraine and maybe this is this is partly a result of the Afghanistan fall is they thought, well, the West is weak. They're not going to intervene. They mm. don't have the. The, the, the gumption or the will to do this anymore mm. is that the West is, I hate to put it, but maybe the West is back, right? They were in many mm. ways stronger than we were before. We brought in new NATO allies. We agreed on a common purpose. Now, I'm not necessarily convinced by this democracy versus non-democracy, you know, um, division or distinction, you know, that often gets us into trouble. You think back to Mr. Bush's axis of evil types of remarks, right? These things aren't necessarily helpful, but in many ways, that's, that's, that's where we are. And, um that would be the one thing i would i would i would pull out from all of this on the economic side of things it's really difficult to be optimistic and you know i i i'm not sure what the average age of the listeners will be on this but if you're a young person today and i no longer am consider, allowed to consider myself young i'm afraid but if you're don't shake your head too much man, no, but, uh, agree, <laughs> but if you're a younger young, person you're young. if you're a younger person it's, it's going to be a really difficult time because mm -hmm. You know, you're going to face higher, you're going to face cost of living pressures. And it's not just cost of living about, you know, buying yourself, you know, your breads and your cereals and your milks and your cheeses. It's how are you going to afford a place to live? How are you going to get access to a mortgage? Um, how are you going to find a, a decent, secure, uh, you know, and, and well paying job when a lot of uh, firms, even in Europe, and of course, you know, listeners in Spain in particular, you know, these types of long term, um, you know, more permanent positions in the workforce are gone as a result of the reforms that were implemented in many economies following uh, the global financial crisis in the name of labor market flexibility. So labor market outsiders, the young, are, are going to face a really difficult difficult time. And, and that's going to infart, breed into or feed into what Mick started off with at the start of our session about this labor militancy, right? Young people in particular mm -hmm. are really going to struggle. And when you add on to this other concerns young people have about climate change, about about you know social and political equity, uh, inequality, and these sorts of things. It's going to be a, a, a rough time, and 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 the politicians in, in in our in our democratic societies have yet to fully address those types of concerns. And one of the reasons why, and it's on display in this country in particular, but also elsewhere, is that the young people, for whatever reason, you know, they make a lot of noise, but they fail to show up. At the ballot box, and so when it when push comes to shove, their interests are often put aside, and we, politicians all too um, easily kick the can down the road and, and force them to pay the cost over the long term. Right? If you're if you're someone who's trying to build up a pension, someone to buy a house, uh, the types of benefits, the types of savings opportunities you're going to have to enjoy the riches of you know, what I was able to enjoy and, and mixed generation was able to enjoy, those things are no longer on offer to you. And, and that's, a, that's a serious problem in Western democracies that they're going to have to address. It's also a problem in places like, like China as well, where the, the young people are going to face mm. less opportunities than their parents did um, in terms of economic growth, in terms of building up riches. Mm. Um, and, and, and China also faces problems in terms of inequality, just like the West. In fact, it's just as, as unequal mm. as, say, the UK than the United States. And I'll, I'll, leave, it that, I'll leave it at that. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the, 
perhaps the benefits or the uh, the, the experiences that that we had in in the non-inflationary continuous expansion decade in the in the in the nineties, the nice decade as as Mervyn King, as the governor of the Bank of England called it at the time, I believe, it was popularly known. Whilst it was a a, a, a decade of extreme geopolitical shocks, I mean, without question, um, in terms of the interest rate and the and inflation targeting policy that came out of that period was was a very interesting one too. But for up, up to a point, we're no longer anywhere near that in terms of those those policies and those outcomes. I think which which served many people well, whilst the rest of the world was, a, a, of course, extremely complicated and, and really on, on Europe's doorstep at the same time. So, so we shall see, but I can only just say, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Mick. Thank you for your intervention and, and, the, and the dialogue and, and uh, discussion we've had today. And of course, thank you so much to the foundation for supporting and collaborating in, in, a, in a genuine partnership between the LSC and the Fundación Oreces. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you for all of you for uh, listening into our session today. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you again.